tawassul. So we have lawful tawassul, unlawful shirk tawassul, or polytheistic tawassul, and the last one is the innovative or the innovated tawassul. We don't differ, Muslims as an ummah do not differ on the first. We all agree on the valid tawassul. So what is the valid tawassul? Before I elaborate and give you the definition of tawassul and the actual various kinds, the acceptable, unacceptable, and the innovative, let us first introduce it in this fashion. Why am I doing this today or tonight? Why do we discuss these issues? Ever since, you know, lectures were actually nice and subtle. We were discussing music and we were discussing, you know, other things. Everybody was happy. And as soon as we started dealing with issues that wind up conflicting with other Muslims on the scene, you know, I know from the comments I receive on the YouTube videos and the emails that people start sending me, now we're starting to create some, uh, some talk. And, uh, you, know, def defend, you know, the defensive team or the defense of these various du'at which we have mentioned in order to warn the Muslims. Some people think it's fun. Like I go look for people and try to mention their names and say, brother, you know, from my understanding of the deen, this is what I get in emails, from my understanding of the deen, that you don't mention people, you only mention the errors that the people have. Well, your understanding of the deen is not sound. Your understanding of the deen is not sound. The whole science of jarh and ta'deel, the whole science of hadith, is based on labeling people. This man, they call him Kathab, Mudallis. He's a liar. He would forge narrations. Don't, how do you think we know a hadith is da'if or sahih or, or, or otherwise? It is through the science of hadith which had men dedicated, dedicated to actually labeling and identifying who is sound and who is not. Why am I saying this? There are times where you need to mention the people in order for the Muslims to know. Only to warn the Muslims, not for fun. Otherwise it's backbiting, it's haram. If I mention someone's name without the intent that the people, the Muslims are warned from this person and his deviance, then I am sinful. And it is impossible that I will come give a lecture, you know, teaching the people to be good and then I go against it myself, unless I do it by mistake. But I say to them again, Open the book of Imam al-Nawawi, which everyone knows. Open the chapter of backbiting and read the six exceptions. One of them is when you have to warn the Muslims against danger, individuals and concepts. So if I don't say Hamza Yusuf, I just speak about Sufis. And in one of the lectures, he denied being a Sufi. But you'd go to his website and it's all Sufi. What will happen to the people? They'll continue to listen this, to this individual without knowing that they're listening to someone who's a Sufi. And the list goes on and on and on. So the names are being mentioned in order for the Muslims who watch this to be notified. Be careful of these individuals. As soon as they retract their statements and go back to the Sunnah, we will put them on my, on my bald head. I'll put them right here. And I will praise them and speak good of them and make everyone know and go listen and learn from them. No problem. We don't have enmity against the individuals. We have enmity against the propagation and the religion which they are bringing to the people, not the one that we know from the Quran and the Sunnah. Until they change their ways, we will not change our way. Let it be known. If those who don't like it, don't like it, then we will deal with it on the Day of Judgment before Allah. But until then, we know from the history of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een that warning Muslims against deviant individuals is nothing new to the deen. But it is done according to necessity. So, as Allah said, أَوْ إِيَّاكُمْ لَعَلَى هُدًا أَوْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ One of the, my favorite ayat in the book of Allah. The most eloquent, the most amazing ayat in the book of Allah. وَإِنَّ أَوْ إِيَّاكُمْ Those other individuals. لَعَلَى هُدًا أَوْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Look at the choice of words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And verily, indeed, Inna we, wa'iyakum, or you are either upon, on, ala, upon guidance or in manifest error. And the ulama say, why did Allah use the preposition ala, on? Because guidance will raise you, guidance will elevate you. So he said, upon guidance, on guidance. When he spoke about deviance and being misguided, which will actually belittle you and defame you, he said, fi, in. 
So on and in, which is better? On, being on top. That's what it boils down to, which teaches us that there's only one truth in Islam. There's no Allah. Yeah, he is on the truth and you're on the truth and they're on the truth. No, there's no such thing, Habibi. There's only one truth. Either we are following it or we have to work on following it. Period. There's nothing in between. So either we are upon guidance, you or I, you or we, either are upon guidance or in manifest error. There's no third option. On these bases, this lecture is being delivered. On these bases, we will see. Some, one of us will be upon guidance and the other one in manifest error. If I am in manifest error, bi'idhnillah, with the correct evidences, sound evidences, I am willing the next day to retract my position and go with the guidance wherever it goes. We're not here trying to be arrogant or trying to turn it into some, you know, some uh, sectarianism. We're dealing here with the deen of Allah. Each one of us is obliged to follow the truth whenever he recognizes it. And we have recognized in the truth in what we're saying. If someone has a truth in opposition to this one, which proves this one to be falsehood, I will change my ways. But you know what? We've read the statements of the scholars. And we've read the books that they've authored. And we've heard both parties concerning this issue. And alhamdulillah, the truth is clear, as it will become clear to you by the end of this lecture as well. Bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal. So what is tawassul? Tawassul or wasila. Different derivatives of the same root word. التوسل إلى الشيء هو التوسل إليه ما نتقرب به إلى الله ليقربنا منه أو ليقربنا منه ويرضى عنا سبحانه وتعالى. It actually means to draw near to something. It is means to get to something, approach something, have access to something, get near to something. And when we say al wasila ila Allah, meaning we are seeking means with which we can become nearer to Allah. Means with which we can get closer to Allah, attain Allah's pleasure, Allah's satisfaction with us, and Allah's reward. Is the definition clear? That is wasila. Now, it's like longing for something. Longing for something. Now, the wasila comes in the Quran. In two different two different ayat in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. The first one is Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu attaqu Allah wa abtaghu ilayhi al-wasila wa jahidu fi sabilihi la'allakum tuflihun. Oh you who have believed, have taqwa of Allah and the most important element of taqwa is worshipping Allah alone and dedicating dua strictly to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah said and seek means of approach. Seek means of nearness to him and strive in his cause, perhaps you will attain success. So Allah told us to seek wasila. Now, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and this is reaffirmed and reinforced by the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, which you can refer to on your own time. He said, seek means of approach by doing deeds which Allah is pleased with. How is it done? By doing good deeds which are pleasing to Allah. This is what is intended by Allah says, وَابْتَغُوا and seek ilayhi to him al wasila. And seek to him means of getting nearer to him. Means of approaching him. How do you do so? By obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and following the deen of Islam as understood by the Sahaba. This is the way we get nearer to Allah azza wa jal. And we have other ex explanations which we will mention. The second ayah is أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمُ الْوَسِيلَ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبْ وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَافُونَ عَذَابَهُ Now, the, let me give you the context of the ayah. There used to be some of the Arabs, some of the Arabs back then who worshipped some of the jinn. 